Hello everybody, how's it going? Thanks for joining me for the read aloud. I'm just gonna let people on Twitter know that the read aloud is now live. the read aloud didn't happen yesterday i had homework to do a lot of it but now i am doing all right so yeah that helps i am still a little out of it though because i went for a bike ride and it was really nice and i feel a bit more human but definitely still a little out of it all right thanks for joining hey taryn how's it going All right, so, hey mom, thanks for joining. All right, so last we left off, Lydia has run off with Mr. Wickham and is now facing possible ruin unless she gets married to him. Um, so that's more or less where we left off. Uh, everyone else is really stressed out about it. Uh, Elizabeth and Jane are in particular stressed out because they're trying to keep the family together and from going insane a little bit. And yeah, that's more or less where we left off. So now we're on to the next chapter, which is chapter 49. Thanks for tuning in. So. There we go. That way you won't get seasick because my legs will keep moving. Uh, chapter 49. Two days after Mr. Bennett's return, as Jane and Elizabeth were walking together in the shrubbery behind the house, they saw the housekeeper coming towards them, and concluding that she came to call them to their mother, went forward to meet her. But instead of the expected summons, when they approached her, she said to Miss Bennett, I beg your pardon, ma madam, for interrupting you. I was in hopes you might have got some good news from town, so I took the liberty of coming to ask. What do you mean, Hill? We have heard nothing from town. Dear madam, cried Mrs. Hill in his great astonishment, don't you know there is an express come for master from Mr. Gardner? He has been here this half hour and master has had a letter. Away ran the girls, too eager to get in to have time for speech. They ran through the vestibule into the breakfast room, from thence into the library. Their father was in neither, and they were on the point of seeking him upstairs with their mother when they were met by the butler, who said, If you are looking for my master, ma'am, he is walking towards the little copse. Upon this information, they instantly passed through the hall once more and ran across the lawn for their father, who was deliberately pursuing his way towards a small wood on one side of the paddock. And Jane, who was not so light nor so much in the habit of running as Elizabeth, soon lagged behind while her sister, panting for breath, came up with him and eagerly cried out, Oh, Papa, what news, what news, what news? Have you heard from my uncle? Yes, I have had a letter from him by express. Well, and what news does it bring, good or bad? What is there of good to be expected, said he, taking the letter from his pocket, but perhaps you would like to read it. Elizabeth impatiently caught it from his hand. N Jane now came up. Read it aloud, said their father, for I hardly know what it is about myself. Grace Church Street, Monday, August 2nd. My dear brother, at last I am able to send you some tidings of my niece, and such as, upon the whole, I hope it will give you satisfaction. Soon after you left me on Saturday, I was fortunate enough to find out in what part of London they were. The particulars I reserve till we meet. It is enough to know they are discovered. I have seen them both. Then it is as, then it is as I always hoped, cried Jane. They are married. Elizabeth read on. I have seen them both. They are not married, nor can I find there was any intention of being so. If you are willing to perform the engagements which I have ventured to make on your side, I hope it will not be long before they are. All that is required of you is to assure to your daughter, by settlement, 
her equal share of the 5,000 pounds secured among your children after the decease of yourself and my sister. And, moreover, you enter into an engagement of allowing her, during your life, 100 pounds per unum. These are conditions which, considering everything, I had no hesitation in complying with, as far as I thought myself privileged, for you. I shall send this by express, that no time may be lost in bringing me your answer. You will easily comprehend from these particulars that Mr. Wickham's circumstances are not so hopelessly as they are generally believed to be. The world has been deceived in that respect, and I am happy to say there will be some little money, even when all of his debts are discharged, to settle on my niece, in addition to her own fortune. If, as I conclude will be the case, you send me full power to act in your name throughout the whole of this business, I will immediately give directions to Hagerston for preparing a proper settlement. There will not be the smallest occasion for your coming to town again. Therefore, stay quiet at Longbourn and depend on my diligence and care. Send back your answer as fast as you can. And be careful to write explicitly. We have judged it best that my niece should be married from this house, of which I hope you will approve. She comes to us today. I shall write again as soon as any more is determined on. Yours, etc. Edward Gardner. Is it possible, cried Elizabeth when she had finished, can it be possible that he will marry her? Wickham is not so undeserving, then, as we thought him, said her sister. My dear father, I congratulate you. And have you answered the letter, cried Elizabeth? No, but it must be done soon. Most earnestly did she then entreat him to lose no more time before he wrote. Oh, dear, my dear father, she cried, come back and write immediately. Consider how important every moment is in such a case. Let me write for you, said Jane, if you dislike the trouble yourself. I dislike it very much, he replied, but it must be done. And so saying, he turned back with them and walked towards the house. And may I ask, said Elizabeth, but the terms, I suppose, must be complied with. Complied with? I am only ashamed of his asking so little. And they must marry, yet he's such a man. Yes, yes, they must marry. There is nothing else to be done. But there are two things that I want very much to know. One is how much money your uncle has laid down to bring it out, and the other, how am I ever to pay him? Money? My uncle? cried Jane. What do you mean, sir? I mean that no man in his senses would marry Lydia on this so slight a temptation 100 a year during my life and 50 after I am gone. That is very true, said Elizabeth, though it had not occurred to me before. His debts to be discharged and something still to remain. Oh, it must be my uncle's doing. Generous, good man, I am afraid he has distressed himself. A small sum could not do all this. No, said her father. Wickham's a fool if he takes her with a farthing less than ten thousand pounds. I should be sorry to think so ill of him in the very beginning of our relationship. Ten thousand pounds? Heaven forbid! How is half such a sum to be repaid? Mr. Bennet made no answer, and each of them, deep in thought, continued silent till they reached the house. Their father then went on to the library to write, and the girls walked into the breakfast room. And they are really to be married! How strange that is! And for this we are to be thankful, that they should be married, happy, small, is, small as is their chance of happiness, and wretched as is his character, we are forced to rejoice. Oh, Lydia! I comfort myself with thinking, replied Jane, that he certainly would not marry Lydia if he had not a real regard for her. Though our kind uncle has done something towards clearing him, I cannot believe that ten thousand pounds, or anything like it, has been advanced. He has children of his own, and more, and may have more. How could he spare half ten thousand pounds? If he were ever able to learn what Wickham's debts have been, said Elizabeth, and how much is settled on his side for our sister, we shall know exactly what Mr. Gardner has done for them, because Wickham has not six pence of his own. The kindness of my uncle and aunt can never be requited. Their taking her home and affording her their personal protection and countenance is such a sacrifice to her advantage as years of gratitude cannot enough acknowledge. By this time, she is actually with them. 
If such goodness does not make her miserable now, she will never deserve to be happy. What a meeting for her when she first sees my aunt. We must endeavor to forget all that has happened on either side, said Jane. I hope and trust they will yet be happy. His consenting to marry her is a proof, I will believe, that he is coming to a right way of thinking. Their mutual affection will steady them, and I flatter myself they will settle so quietly and live in a so rational a manner as may in time make their past imprudence forgotten. Their conduct has been such, replied Elizabeth, as neither you nor I nor anybody can ever talk any forget. Sorry, it is useless to talk of it. It, it now occurred to the girls that their mother was all likelihood perfectly ignorant of what had happened. They went to the library, therefore, and asked their father whether he would wish them to make it, make it known to her. He was writing, and without raising his head, coolly replied, Just as you please. May we take my uncle's letter to read to her? Take whatever you like and get away. Elizabeth took the letter from his writing table, and they went upstairs together. Mary and Kitty were both with Mrs. Bennet. One communication would, therefore, do for all. After a slight preparation for good news, the letter was read aloud. Mrs. Bennet could hardly contain herself. As soon as Jane had read Mrs. Mr. Gardner's hope of Lydia's being soon married, her joy burst forth, and every following sentence added to its exuberance. She was now in an irritation as violent from delight as she had ever been fidgety from alarm and vexation. To know that her daughter would be married was enough. She was disturbed by no fear for her felicity, nor humbled by any remembrance of her misconduct. My dear, dear Lydia, she cried, this is delightful indeed. She will be married. I shall see her again. She will be married at sixteen. My good, kind brother, I knew how it would be. I knew he would manage everything. How I long to see her, and to see dear Wickham, too. But the clothes, the wedding clothes... I will write to my sister Gardner about them directly. Lizzie, my dear, run down to your father and ask him how much he will give her. Stay, stay, I will go myself. Ring the bell, Kitty, for Hill. I will put on my things in a moment. My dear, dear Lydia, how merry we shall be how merry we shall be together when we meet. Her eldest daughter endeavored to give some relief to the violence of these transports by leading her thoughts to the obligations which Mr. Gardner's behavior laid them all under. For we must attribute this happy conclusion, she added, in a great measure to his kindness. We are persuaded that he has pl pledged himself to assist Mr. Wickham with money. Well, cried the mother, it is all very right. Who should do it but her own uncle? If he had not had a family of his own, and I and my children must have had all his money, you know, and it is the first time we had ever had anything from him except a few presents. Well, I am so happy. In a short time, I shall have a daughter married. Mrs. Wickham, how well it sounds, and she was only sixteen last June. My dear Jane, I am in such a flutter that I am sure I can't write. So I will dictate, and you write for me. We will settle with your father about the money afterwards, but the thing should be ordered immediately. She was then proceeding to, to all the particulars of calico, muslin, and cambric, and would surely have dictated some very plentiful orders had not Jane, though with some difficulty, persuaded her to wait till her father was at leisure to be consulted. One day's delay, she observed, would be of small importance, and her mother was too happy to be quite so obstinate as usual. Other schemes, too, came into her head. I will go to Merrington, said she, as soon as I am dressed, and tell the good news to my sister Phillips, and I can't and as I come back, I can call on Lady Lucas and Mrs. Long. Kitty, run down and order the carriage. An airing would do me a great deal of good, I am sure. Girls, can I get, do anything for you in Meryton? Oh, here comes Hill. My dear Hill, have you heard the good news? Miss Lydia is going to be married, and you shall have all, and you shall all have a bowl of punch to make merry at her wedding. Mrs. Hill began instantly to express her joy. Elizabeth received her congratulations amongst the rest, and then, sick of this folly, took refuge in her own room, that she might think with freedom. Poor Lydia's situation must, at best, be bad enough, but that, was, but that it was no worse, she had need to be thankful. She felt it so, and though, in looking forward, neither rational happiness nor worldly prosperity could be justly expected for her sister, 
In looking back to what they had feared, only two hours ago, she felt all the advantages of what they had gained. And that is the end of chapter 49. Well, at least it looks like the, um, Liddy is actually getting married to Wickham, so she's not completely ruined. And that's good, because she would ruin the family with her. Although 10,000 pounds is an extremely lot amount of money at that time. So I can't imagine the uh, Mr. Gardner be able to pay that much, because that is insane. All right, now we're on to chapter 50. Mr. Bennett had very often wished before this period of, in his, of his life that instead of spending his whole income, he had laid it by an annual sum for the better provision of his children and of his wife. If she survived him. Sorry. He had laid by an annual sum for the better provision of his children and of his wife if she survived him. He now wished it more than ever. Had he done his duty in that respect, Lydia need not have been indebted to her uncle for whatever of honor or credit could now be purchased for her. The satisfaction of prevailing on one of the most worthless young men in Great Britain to be her husband might have then rested in its proper place. He was seriously concerned that a cause of so little advantage to anyone should be forwarded at the sole expense of his brother-in-law, and he was determined, if possible, to find out the extent of his assistance and to discharge the obligation as soon as he could. When first Mr. Bennett had married, economy was held to be perfectly useless, for, of course, they were to have a son. The son was to join in cutting off the entail as soon as he should be of age, and the widow and younger children would by that means be provided for. Five daughters successively entered the world, but yet the son was yet to come. And Mrs. Bennett, for many years after Lydia's birth, had been certain that he would. This event had at last been despaired of, but it was then too late to be saving. Mrs. Bennett had no turn for economy, and her husband's love of independence had alone prevented their exceeding their income. Five thousand pounds was settled by marriage articles on Mrs. Bennett and the children, but in what proportions? It should be divided amongst the latter, depended on the will of the parents. This was one point, with regard to Lydia at least, which was now to be settled, and Mr. Bennett could have no hesitation in acceding to the proposal before him. In terms of grateful acknowledgement for the kindness of his brother, though, expressed more concisely, he then delivered on paper his perfect approbation of all that was done, and his willingness to fulfill the engagements that had been made for him. He had never before supposed that, could Wickham be prevailed on to marry his daughter, it would be done with so little inconvenience to himself as by the present arrangement. He would scarcely be ten thousand pounds a year the loser by the hundred that was to be paid them, for, what with her board and pocket allowance, and the continual presence in money which passed to her through her mother's hands, Lydia's expenses had been very little within that sum. That it would be done with such trifling exertion on his side, too, was another very welcome surprise, for his wish at present was to have as little trouble in the business as possible. When the first transports of rage which had produced his activity in seeking her were over, he naturally returned to all his former indolence. His letter was soon dispatched, for, though dilatory in undertaking business, he was quick in ex his execution. He begged to know further particulars of what he was indebted to his brother, but was too angry with Lydia to send any message to her. The good news spread quickly through the house, and with proportionate speed through the neighborhood, it was borne in the latter with decent philosophy. To be sure, it would have been more of the advantage of conversation had Miss Lydia Bennet come upon the town, or as the happiest alternative, been secluded from the world in some distant farmhouse. But there was much to be talked of in marrying her and the good nature wishes for her well-doing, which had proceeded from all the spiteful old ladies in Meryton, lost but a little of their spirit in this change of circumstances, because with such a husband her misery was considered certain. It was a fortnight since Mrs. Bennet had been downstairs, but on this happy day she again took her seat at the head of her table, and in spirits oppressively high, no sentiment of shame gave a damp to her triumph. The marriage of the daughter, 
which had been the first object of her wishes since Jane was 16, was now on the point of accomplishment, and her thoughts and her words ran wholly on these attendants of elegant nuptials, fine nuptials, elegant nuptials, excuse me, fine muslins, new carriages, and servants. She was busily searching through the whole neighborhood for a proper situation for her daughter, and, without knowing or considering what their income might be, rejected many as deficient in size and importance. Hi, Park might do, said she, if the Goldings could quit it, or the great house at Stoke, if the drawing room were larger, but Ashworth is too far off. I could not bear to have her ten miles from me, and as for Pulvis Lodge, the attics are dreadful. Her husband allowed to talk on without interruption while the servants remained, but when they had withdrawn, he said to her, Mrs. Bennet, before you take any or all of these houses for your son and daughter, let us come to a right understanding. Into one house in this neighborhood they shall never have admittance. I, not, I will not encourage the impudence of either by receiving them at Longbourn. A long dispute followed this declaration, but Mr. Bennet was firm. It was soon led to another, and Mrs. Bennet found, with amazement and horror, that her husband would not advance a guinea to buy clothes for his daughter. He protested that she should receive from him no mark of affection whatever on the occasion. Mrs. Bennet could hardly comprehend it, that his anger could be carried to such a point of inconceivable resentment as to refuse his daughter a privilege without which her marriage would scarcely seem valid exceeded all she could believe possible. She was more alive to the disgrace which, she, which her want of new clothes must reflect on her daughter's nuptials than to any sense of shame at her eloping and living with Wickham a fortnight before they took place. Elizabeth was now most heartily sorry that she had, from the distress of the moment, been led to make Mr. Darcy acquainted with their fears for her sister, for since her marriage would so shortly give the proper termination to the elopement, they might hope to conceal its unfavorable beginning from those who were not immediately on the spot. She had no fear of it spreading farther through his means, so there were few people on whose secrecy she could more confidently depend it. But, at the same time, there was no one whose knowledge of a sister's frailty would have mortified her so much, and not, however, from any fear of disadvantage from it individually to herself, for at any rate there seemed a gulf impassable between them. Had Lydia's marriage been concluded on the most honorable terms, it was not to be supposed that Mr. Darcy would connect himself with a family where, to every other objection, would now be added an alliance and relationship of the nearest kind with a man whom he just so justly scorned. From such a connection she would not wonder that he would shrink. The wish of procuring her regard, which she had assured herself of his feelings in Derbyshire, could not in rational expectation survive such a blow as this. She was humbled, she was grieved, she repented, though she hardly knew of what. She became jealous of his esteem, where she could no longer hope to be benefited by it. She wanted to hear of him, when there seemed the least chance of gaining intelligence. She was convinced that she could have been happy with him, when it was no longer likely they should meet. What a triumph for him, as she often thought, could he know that the proposals which she had proudly spurned only four months ago would now have been most gladly and gratefully received. He was as generous, she doubted not, as the most generous of his sex. But while he was mortal, there must be a triumph. She began now to comprehend that he was exactly the man who, in disposition and talents, would most suit her. His understanding and temper, though unlike her own, would have answered all her wishes. It was in a union that must have been to the advantage of both. By her ease and liveliness, his mind might have been softened and his manners improved, and from his judgment, information, and knowledge of the world, she must have received benefit of greater importance. But no such ma happy marriage can now teach the admiring multitude with connubial city under what? Sorry, excuse me. But no such happy marriage can now teach the admiring multitude what connubial felicity really was. Was soon to be formed in their family. How Wickham and Lydia were to be supported in tolerable independence she could not imagine, but how little of permanent happiness could belong to a couple who were only brought together because their passions were stronger than their virtue she could easily conjecture. Mr. Gardner soon wrote again to his brother, 
To Mr. Bennett's acknowledgments, he briefly replied with assurance of his eagerness to promote the welfare of any of his family, and concluded with entreaties that the subject might never be mentioned to him again. The principal purport of his letter was to inform them that Mr. Wickham had resolved on quitting the militia. It was greatly my wish that he should do so, he added, as soon as his marriage was fixed on. And I think you will agree with me in considering the removal from the court as highly advisable, both on his account and my niece's. It is Mr. Wickham's intention to go into the regulars, and among his former friends, there are still some who are able and willing to assist him in the army. He has the promise of an insignia of an insignia in He has the promise to be a general. Okay, he has a promise to be part of a general's regiment, now quartered in the north. It is an advantage to have it so far from this part of the kingdom. He promises fairly, and I hope among different people, where they may each have a character to preserve, they will both be more prudent. I have written to Colonel Forrester to inform him of our present arrangements, and to request that he will satisfy the various creditors of Mr. Wickham in and near Brighton, which with assurances of speedy payment, for which I have pledged myself. And will you give yourself the trouble of carrying similar assurances to his creditors in Meryton, of whom I shall subjoin a list according to his information? He has given in all his debts. I hope at least he has not deceived us. Haggerston has our directions, and all will be completed in a week. They will then join his regiment unless they are first invited to Longbourn. And I understand from Mrs. Gardner that my niece is very desirous of seeing you all before she leaves the South. She is well and begs to be dutifully remembered to you and her mother. Yours, etc., E. Gardner. Mr. Bennett and his daughters saw all the advantages of Wickham's removal from the Shire as clearly as Mr. Gardner could do. But Mrs. Bennett was not so well pleased with it. Lydia's being settled in the North, just when she had expected most pleasure and pride in her company, for she had no means given up her plan of their resort residing in Hertfordshire, was a severe disappointment. And besides, it was such a pity that Lydia should be taken from a regiment where she was acquainted with everybody and had so many favorites. She is so fond of Mrs. Forster, said she. It will be quite shocking to send her, her away. And there are several of the young men, too, that she likes very much. The officers may not be so pleasant in this general's regiment. His daughter's request for such it might be considered of being admitted into her family again before she set off for the north received at first an absolute negative. But Jane and Elizabeth, who agreed in wishing for the sake of their sister's feelings and consequence that she should be married on her parent, uh, that she should, sorry, excuse me. But Jane and Elizabeth, who agreed in wishing for the sake of their sister's feelings and consequence that she should be noticed on her marriage by her parents, urged him so earnestly, yet so rationally, and so mildly, to receive her and her husband at Longbourn as soon as they were married, that he was prevailed on to think as they thought, and act as they wished. And their mother had the satisfaction of knowing that she would be able to show her married daughter in the neighborhood before she was banished to the north. When Mr. Bennett wrote again, therefore, he sent his permission for them to come, and settled that as soon as the ceremony was over, they should proceed to Longbourn. Elizabeth was surprised, however, that Wickham should consent to such a scheme, and had she consulted only her own inclination, any meeting with him would have been the last object of her wishes. And that is the end of chapter 50. And yeah, I think Elizabeth would like a proposal from Darcy right now very much. Although it doesn't quite seem likely, because Darcy knows all the particulars about the whole scandal with Lydia and everything. And you're right, Mr. Bennett really does suck. It's a little annoying that right now he is wishing that he put stuff aside for his daughters. Like, apparently he had thought of it many times before and he still never did it. So he's still irresponsible with money and he still doesn't care enough to actually set aside money for his daughters and wife after he passes. But you're right, Mom, it could have been someone else who paid off Wickham, considering that would have been a lot of money for Mr. Gardner, or for anybody, honestly. Like, Mr. Wickham must, sorry, Mr. Wickham must have gotten himself into a, like, a lot of debt to actually 
to have, have 10,000 pounds be like what settles him with a little bit extra. All right, now we are on to chapter 51. Thanks so much for tuning in, guys. I hope you guys are enjoying this. I actually, I definitely am. Sorry I'm a little tired today, but I am enjoying this, I promise. And I hope you guys are too. Their sister's wedding day arrived, and Jane and Elizabeth felt for her probably more than she felt for herself. The carriage was sent to meet them, and they were to return in it by dinner time. Their arrival was dreaded by the elder Miss Bennets, and Jane more especially, who gave Lydia the feelings which would have tended herself had she been the culprit, and was wretched in the thought of what her sister must endure. They came. The family were assembled in the breakfast room to receive them. Smiles decked the face of Mrs. Bennet as the carriage drove up to the door. Her husband looked impenetrably grave, her daughters alarmed, anxious, uneasy. Lydia's voice was heard in the vestibule. The door was thrown open, and she ran into the room. Her mother stepped forward, embraced her, and welcomed her with rapture gave her hand with an affectionate smile to Wickham, who followed his lady, and wished them both joy with an alac alacrity which showed no, hap no doubt of their happiness. Their reception from Mr. Bennet, to whom they had, had turned, was not quite so cordial. His countenance rather gained in austerity, and, his scarcely opened his, and he scarcely opened his lips. The easy assurance of the young couple, indeed, was enough to provoke him. Elizabeth was disgusted, and even Miss Bennet was shocked. Lydia was Lydia still, untamed, unabashed, wild, noisy, and fearless. She turned from sister to sister, demanding their congratulations, and when at length they all sat down, looked eagerly around the room, turned to notice of some little alteration in this, of some little alteration in it, and observed with a laugh that it was a great while since she had been there. Wickham was not at all more distressed than herself, but his manners were always so pleasing that he had his character and his marriage been exactly what they ought. His smiles and his easy address, where he, while he claimed their relationship, would have delighted them all. Elizabeth had not before believed him quite equal to such assurance, but she sat down, resolving within herself to draw no limits in further to the imprudence of such... A, sorry, excuse me. Resolving within herself to draw no limits in future to the impudence of an impudent man. She blushed and Jane blushed, but the cheeks of the two who caused their confusion suffered no variation of color. There was no want of discourse. The bride and her mother would neither of them could neither of them talk fast enough, and Wickham, who happened to sit near Elizabeth, began inquiring after his acquaintance in the neighborhood with a good humored ease which she felt very unequal to unable to equal in her replies. They seemed each of them to have the happiest memories in the world. None of the past was recollected with pain, and Elizabeth and Lydia, who led voluntarily to subjects which her sister would not have alluded to for the world. Only think of its being three months, she cried, since I went away. It seems but a fortnight, I declare, and yet there have been things enough happened in that time. Good gracious, when I went away, I am sure I had no more idea of being married till I came back again, though it would be a very good fun if I was. His, her father lifted up his eyes. Jane was distressed. Elizabeth looked expressively at Lydia, but she, who never nor, never heard nor saw anything of which she chose to be insensible, gaily continued, Oh, Mamma, do the people hereabouts know I am married today? I was afraid they might not. And we overtook William Golding in his curricle, so I was determined he should know it. And so I let down the side glass next to him, and took off my glove, and let my hand just rest upon, upon the window frame, so that he might see the ring. And then I bowed and smiled like anything. Elizabeth could bear it no longer. She got up and ran out of the room, and returned no more, till she heard them passing through the hall to the dining parlor. She then joined them soon enough to see Lydia, with anxious parade, walk up to her mother's right hand and hear her say to her elder sister, "'Ah, oh, Jane, I take your place now, and you must go lower, because I am a married woman.' It was not to be supposed that time would give Lydia that embarrassment from which she had been so wholly free at first. Her ease and good spirits increased. She longed to see Mrs. Phillips, the Lucases, and all their other neighbors, and to hear herself called Mrs. Wickham by each of them. 
And in the meantime, she went after dinner to show her ring and boast of being married to Mrs. Hill and the two housemaids. Well, Mama, said she when they were all returned to the breakfast room, and what do you think of my husband? Is not he a charming man? I am sure my sisters must all envy me. I only hope that they might have half my good luck. They must all go to Brighton. That is the place to get husbands. What a pity it is, Mama, we did not all go. Very true. And if I had my will, we should. But, my dear Lydia, I don't at all like your going such a long way off. Must it be so? Oh, Lord, yes. There is nothing in that. I shall like it of all things. You and Papa and my sisters must come down and see us. We shall be at Newcastle all winter, and I dare say there will be some balls, and I will take good care to get good partners for them all. I should like it beyond anything, said her mother. And then when you go away, you may leave one or two of my sisters behind you, and I dare say I shall get husbands for them before the winter is over. I thank you for my share of the favor, said Elizabeth, but I do not particularly like your way of getting husbands. The visitors were not to remain above ten days with them. Mr. Wickham had received his commission before he left London, and he was to join his regiment at the end of a fortnight. No one but Mrs. Bennet regretted that their stay would be so short, and she made the most of them by visiting about with her daughter and having very frequent parties at home. These parties were acceptable to all. To avoid a family circle was even more desirable to such as did think than as did not than such as did not. Wickham's affection for Lydia was just what Elizabeth had expected to find it, not equal to Lydia's for him. She had scarcely needed her present observation to be satisfied for the reason of things, that their elopement had been brought on by the strength of her love rather than by his, and she would have wondered why, without violently caring for her, he had chose to elope with her at all, had she not felt certain that his flight was rendered necessary by distress of circumstances, and if that were the case, he was not the young man to resist an opportunity of having a companion. Lydia was exceedingly fond of him. He was her dear Wickham on every occasion. No one was to be put in competition with him. He did everything best in the world, and she was sure she, he would kill more birds on the 1st of September than anybody else in the country. One morning, soon after their arrival, as she was sitting with her two elder sisters, she said to Elizabeth, "'Lizzie, I never gave you an account of my wedding, I believe. "'You were not by when I told Mamma and the others all about it. "'Are you not curious to hear how it was managed?' "'Not really,' replied Elizabeth. "'I think I think there cannot be too little said on the subject. "'Ah, oh, you are so strange. "'But I must tell you how it went off. "'We were married, you know, at St. Clement's "'because Wickham's lodgings were in that parish, "'and it was settled that we should all be there by eleven o'clock.' My uncle and aunt and I were to go together, and the others were to meet us at the church. Well, Monday morning came, and I was in such a fuss. I was so afraid, you know, that something would have put would happen to put it off, and that I should have gone quite distracted. And there was my aunt, all the time I was dressing, preaching and talking away, just as if she were reading a sermon. However, I did not hear above one word in ten, for I was thinking, you may suppose, of my dear Wickham. I longed to know whether he would be married in his blue coat. Well, and so we breakfasted at ten as usual. I thought it would never be over, for, by and by, you are, you are to understand that my uncle and aunt were horrid unpleasant all the time I was with them. If you'll believe me, I did not once put my foot out of doors, though I was there a fortnight. Not one party or schemed or anything. To be sure, London was rather thin, but, however, the little theater was open. Well, and so just as the carriage came to the door, my uncle was called upon business to that horrid man, Mr. Stone. And then, you know, when once they get together, there is no end of it. Well, I was so frightened I did not know what to do, for my uncle was to give me away, and if we were beyond the hour, we could not be married all day. But luckily, he came back again in ten minutes' time, and then we all set out. However, I, recollect, I recollected afterwards that if he had been prevented going, the wedding need not be put off, for Mr. Darcy might have done as well. Mr. Darcy, repeated Elizabeth in utter amazement. Oh, yes, he was to come there with Wickham, you know. But gracious me, I quite forgot. I ought not to have said a word about it. I promised them so faithfully. What will Wickham say? It was to be such a secret. 
If it was to be secret, said Jane, say not another word on the subject. You may depend upon my seeking no further. Oh, certainly, cried Elizabeth, though burning with curiosity. We will ask you no questions. Thank you, said Lydia, for if you did, I should certainly tell you all, and then Wickham would be angry. On such encouragement to ask, Elizabeth was forced to put it out of her power by running away. But to live in ignorance on such a point was impossible, or at least it was impossible not to try for information. Mr. Darcy had been at her sister's wedding. It was exactly a scene and exactly among people where he had apparently least to do and least temptation to go. Conjectures as to the meaning of it, rapid and wild, hurried into her brain, but she was satisfied with none. Those that ple best pleased her, as placing his conduct in the noblest of light, seemed most improbable. She could not bear such suspense. Hastily seizing a sheet of paper, wrote a short letter to her aunt to request an explanation of what Lydia had dropped, if it were compatible with the secrecy which had been intended. You may readily comprehend, she added, what my curiosity must be to know how a person unconnected and with any of us, and, comparatively speaking, a stranger to our family, should have been amongst you at such a time. Pray write instantly, and let me understand it, unless it is, for very cogent reasons, to remain in the secrecy which Lydia seems to think necessary, and then I must be in and then I must endeavor to be satisfied with ignorance. Not that I shall, though, she added to herself as she finished the letter. And my dear aunt, if you do not tell me in an honorable manner, I shall certainly be reduced to tricks and stratagems to find it out. Jane's delicate sense of honor would not allow her to speak to Elizabeth privately of what Lydia had let fall. Elizabeth was glad of it, till it appeared whether her inquiries would receive any satisfaction, she had rather be without a confidant. And that is the end of chapter 51. Yeah, Lydia is definitely pretty arrogant. And considering that Darcy was at their wedding, it looks like he might have actually paid. He might have been the one to pay Wickham off. He is the only one who has that kind of money anyway. So it is very possible that he was the one, especially since he was at the wedding. But thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope you guys enjoyed this. And I hope everyone's staying safe, and I hope you guys all have a good day. Thank you guys so much. Bye.